were Jonas and his team for inviting us to give this presentation on uh, Econovo. Um, I am the chief financial officer since uh, first of April, so I've been at the company for a little less than, than six months. And I will go right ahead. Um, here is Econovo in a nutshell, if you will. Uh, we are a very strong uh, company focused on the delivery of complete inhalation uh, solutions uh, I, uh, to the lung. Uh, we have developed an, an our specializing uh, business called uh, CDMO. I'll come back to what that is. Um, and we uh, have actually developed mo no less than four uh, inhaler or inhaler platforms. Uh, compare that to uh, the bigger companies you know, probably Astra and GSK, would typically have one inhaler, and some of these even come from the outside, not from the company itself. The most famous one probably in Sweden is the Turbohaler from AstraZeneca, and we have a, an improved version of that uh, that I'll show you in a short while. But inhalation is not just the device, it's also about formulation, and uh, we actually boast uh, quite strong competencies also in formulation and analysis, which, which is required when, once you want to develop a program for inhalation. Um, inhalation, uh, contrary to what many may think, it's actually a quite safe and effective delivery of medications uh, relative to oral medications, which may give you systemic side effects, and injection also has its uh, caveat, you can argue. So inhalation to several diseases, which I'll show you, is actually a good uh, alternative of course, it's, it's the mainstay for asthma and COPD patients and a few others with lung diseases. Um, and then we are, in fact, one of the very few companies that actually operate in this space. I'll show you a graph of that a little bit later. On this one, you can see a bit snapshot, a short snapshot of the history of Econovo, founded in 2014, as you can see here. We started off developing a few inhalers, and then in the latter years, we have two new inhalers, during the pandemic, we uh, come up with a very simple, easy nasal administration of a COVID vaccine or other viral medications that we are looking into right now. And you can see also in the bottom here, we started off with a few bigger companies, Amneal, uh, larger generic companies, and now we have attracted quite a few other companies uh, from basically all around the world, US, Australia, and, and Europe. Oops, uh, this one is the business model that we operate. We have uh, been working as a kind of CMO for some time, but now we have formalized a business called uh, CMO. Is there, is there a pointer here? Uh, is there a pointer here? Yeah, yeah this one. Uh, the CDMO business, as you can see here, um, we, we work with companies like Kiox uh, to reformulate an already existing medicine. Uh, for inhalation. It's a small Danish company. And in Lund, we have a, another company called Arcida Pharma that works with a novel treatment of COPD. Uh, so those are some of the, the collaborators or partners that we attract to the CDMO business. Another way to enter uh, our company would to be would to, uh, enter into a license agreement, uh, which is what we have with uh, Amneal, you see here, and the Korean company PNC and the Indian Intas. Uh, and then finally, the third leg of the business model is to simply just sell inhalators or inhalers to uh, companies that can be an inter of interest to, for instance, uh, larger pharmaceutical organizations that want to have that uh, as, the, as their offering. Uh, and then we have started to look into a new area ourselves, which is this area of reformulations, and I'll come back to what that con contains. Our business model is quite scalable, as you can see here. The CDMO business operates like a classical CDMO. You probably knew uh, Resifarm when that was a public company, uh, had a 20, 30% uh, EBITDA margin, and that's exactly where we operate with the business we have there. In the license department, um, it can be quite profitable. Of course, if you get royalties, it's 100% profit to the bottom line. Um, but it also contains license and, and other types of, of fees that we can obtain. And then finally, uh, we have inhaler sales, uh, which also is quite a profitable uh, business. There we don't have the actual production ourselves, but we have a, an agreement with the Italian US Stevenaccio uh, to make one of our inhalers as a contract uh, producer to, uh, to us. 
Uh, the CDMO business that I uh, talked about before, we actually have these uh, six partnerships. We have an agreement with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, on a viral uh, treatment. We have an, uh, another agreement with an Australian company called Ena Respiratory, um, which also works in the viral space, so in the biological uh, space. Uh, then we have, uh, as I mentioned, Aceda, which works in asthma COPD. We have uh, Kiox down here, which operates in rare lung diseases. And then recently we made an agreement with the French uh, Aphelogix, which operates with uh, biological treatments called nanofitins. It's smaller biological substance and smaller than the classical antibodies that you probably yeah. know. The market we operate in is uh, quite significant. Uh, now I'm just looking at the dry powder inhalation market, not the whole asthma um, COPD market, and that is roughly 15 billion US, expected to grow to around 20 billion in 2027. So a growth of 33% over that period, or a, a compounded and annual growth rate around 7%. Um, and we are one of the few that actually are independent and work in this space. Then a new segment is opening up, which is just called new up here, and that is uh, some of the uh, existing lung diseases as pulmonary arterial hypertension, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and of course, cystic fibrosis. But in recent time, as you can see here, actually CNS diseases such as anxiety, depression, migraine, are starting also to become available as inhaled medications. And even more recently, we've seen um, glucagon which is used for people with uh, hypoglycemia uh, to counter that low blood sugar, also as an inhaled medication. The alter alternative there is an injectable product. You can see here, um, it offers uh, an approved product profile typically for uh, the partners that we work with. It's also a lower development risk typically because it's a product that is reformulated, so it's already gone through the regulatory path. It's approved safety-wise, you can say, and also efficacy-wise. So it's typically a lower risk type project. You can see the addressable market just for the ones we show up here. Uh, those uh, seven, eight products or eight, nine products you see here, they have an addressable market which is just below nine billion US. And some of these, as you can see here on the uh, right bottom here, have already become branded products in the market. You probably know J&J, &J, you probably know Lilly, but you can see a number of other mid-sized companies have entered this field uh, to come up with newer reformulated uh, medicines that are some of the projects that we might look into as well. The uh, inhalers we have here, you can see we have partners for most of the platforms we work with, with a notable exception of, um, of uh, Ecopre. This is the Oops, this is the inhaler you see here. Uh, we have a structured process running with the investment bank Stiefel uh, to reach out to uh, partners, uh, potential partners. And we have recently engaged with the US Food and Drug Administration to, um, to get information on what is required to come with a uh, improved version or copy of AstraZeneca, uh, sorry, Glaxo clients, uh, Ellipta, uh, the product they, you see here. And this is one of the best selling asthma COPD medications uh, globally. We have another agreement, as uh, I will allude to shortly, and this is the agreement where we uh, basically copy AstraZeneca's uh, Symbicort Turbohaler, and there we have an agreement with uh, Amneal, the US biotech company. Here's uh, just a chart to show you that uh, we are one of the very few. You want to be in the upper right corner, and we are there, as you can see. We have a few competitors, but not many. And this is the pipeline we have, quite a big pipeline or broad pipeline with uh, the other one being the Amnil project. The second one is this Ecopre that I talked about. And then you can see the breadth and depth of the pipeline we have in the bottom. Finally, uh, to give you some guidance or goalpost, we set out a goalpost for 2027, which is to reach 250 million in revenue. And half of that is to come in as profit, of course, helped by royalty payments, milestone payments, and other types of payments uh, that will kick in. In 2026, we should become 
break even. Nick. Fantastic to start with a presentation that was exactly 10 minutes. So with that, we will um, open the floor to any questions. And like I said, Swedish or English is fine. Uh, then I guess I'll start off with uh, questions. Sure. Um, these numbers look um, look impressive. Uh, how are you going to achieve this, and what are the potential threats in that journey? Well, the, the threats, of course, is the, the development risk that exists for any of these programs. As we work with partners, you know their priorities may change over time. Uh, but I think we have several projects going for us. Uh, as I said, we have um, the EcoPay project here, which is one of the most important projects. Uh, we have the Simpicord project coming a little bit later. Um, so hopefully at least one of these, hopefully both of them, which we expect, will continue to, to progress. Um, so the main risk, I would say, is, is a development risk, but that, that's common for any project, you can say. And in a way, you're competing with big dragons that have resources to put into these kind of, um, uh, this kind of development. How are you, as a small company, uh, handling that, working with that? Well, well, we handle it by working with uh, medium-sized, larger, generic-type companies. As you can see up here, we have Intes, for instance, in India. And then for Ecopay, we are reaching out to some of these larger companies. But of course, you're right, we cannot in ourselves compete with the GlaxoSmith clients and Astra of this world. Uh, but we partner up with other generic companies or with, with generic companies that can, can take these projects forward. Would it be possible at some point to be able to um, own the market, so to speak, and, and, and really just go for all of them? Um, I think it would be more relevant to look into um, geographical segments, so the Nordic space or Northern Europe or something like that. But it's not on the cards, uh, in the cards right now. We have a question over here. Yeah. You briefly touched on the nasal uh, inhaler. Let's let's call it an mm -hmm. inhaler. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you see the differences? And is the nasal one, one might think that it would be easier, but it may not be. What's your view? Yeah, it depends a little bit on which indication you're looking at. Um, we have seen, and in, in, I would say, in recent uh, sh um, what do you call the partner meetings we uh, we went to, that actually there's a quite uh, strong interest in the nasal administration, and you probably know it from just uh, uh, allergic rhinitis that you just have a nasal injection. So, so for some applications or some indications, it can be a very very simple uh, treatment. Uh, for other diseases, you may have to take it directly into the lung. Uh, so it, it goes indication by indication. I wouldn't say one is better or stronger than the other. There are opportunities, I would say, in, in both of these uh, segments. And, and your involvement in the nasal, is that limited or none at this point? No, I mean, the, the, if you go back, you, you can see here. Can I go back here? Or? Oh, I don't know what happened. But, but if you saw the, the ICO-1 uh, inhaler we have, that comes in a, as an inhaled product and as a nasal administration. So there the partner can choose. But typically they have already figured out which route they want to take when they come to us. Yeah, I have another one. Um, you just launched or recently launched an accelerator program, which I was quite curious about. Mm -hmm. uh, can you extend a little bit about uh, why and what makes, uh, yeah, yeah, why? <laughs> well, that, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a twofold approach. It's uh, to get uh, grant money to Econobo, that's one part. But the other part, which is, I think, even more important, is that we can help uh, small startups like Kiox <coughs> that I mentioned before uh, get grant money so they can advance their projects and develop them uh, further. So we work with a party called Argentum in Israel that helps get these uh, applications for grants through EU, uh, and thereby we can have more of these, uh, say, smaller, earlier stage programs that can turn into bigger projects later on, just get started. And what has the interest been so far? It's been quite good, I would say. Okay. I mean, as you saw, we have uh, Kiox uh, mentioned here, and we're working with other okay. uh, collaborators, both slightly larger and, and smaller ones. 
Any further further questions? Uh, what about the um, license fee uh, numbers? Is, is I, I would imagine it's just a few percentage points. And, I think and, you're talking about royalty now. Yeah. Yeah. And are they valid for the entire life of uh, of the product? We, we haven't signed an actual agreement yet, so I, I cannot uh, tell you, but they would be mid-single-digit typically to high-single-digit uh, type royalties. That can be somewhat different for uh, reformulated projects. Uh, I saw a recent well, competitors uh, talk about low single, uh, low double-digit numbers, but I, but I think for the general average, it will be somewhere between 5 and 10%, but can go higher uh, in some programs. Music